I'm a pediatrician with Hogue Medical Group, and today I'll be giving you guys a talk about essential baby products. I'm going to focus my talk on essentially the first six months of life. Um, that's going to be the focus, and I'm going to break this talk down to what I consider to be the absolute essentials, and then some of the extras, which a lot of people also consider to be kind of essential too. Um, so my first list here, we're going to talk in order about um, car seat. This is probably the most essential item that you're going to buy for your baby because you will not be able to leave home from the hospital without it. Um, so this is probably the most important purchase you're going to make. Um, and then some of these other items are also some important big ticket items like bassinet or crib or maybe both, a layette, which is basically the baby's first set of clothes. Um, your choice of diapers. We're going to talk a little bit about what to include into a first aid kit, um, skin care, and feeding issues like nursing supplies, bottles, formula, things like that. So first thing about car seats, um, the first choice that a lot of parents are going to have to make is the decision between do I go with an infant seat or do I go with a convertible seat. A lot of parents prefer the infant seat because it is incredibly convenient. You can transfer your baby very easily from the home back to the car and into a stroller system. A lot of stroller companies make adapters that will accommodate many different models of car seats, making it a really convenient way to click right into a stroller and can carry your baby to and from all the places you're going to. Um, this is also nice too because a lot of the infant seats come with detachable bases. So you have one infant seat and then a base for all the other vehicles that you may be using. Your partner's vehicle, grandparents, aunts and uncles, babysitter, nanny. So it makes it very easy to transfer the baby with the seat and then everybody else who takes care of the baby will also have a base. The downside to an infant car seat is that eventually you will need a convertible seat. The infant seats are essentially designed to accommodate a baby up to about a year of age if they are at the 50th percentile. But a lot of babies outgrow their infant car seat by length before they outgrow it by weight. So some of my larger babies who are a little bit taller or longer sometimes outgrow their infant seat before they turn even nine months of age. The advantage of a convertible seat is that you have just the one seat. It goes from infancy to toddlerhood, and some companies now have an all-in-one kind of seat that can accommodate an infant, toddler, all the way up into the booster stages, so those are becoming a lot more popular as well. The downside to a convertible seat is that they don't necessarily coordinate with a stroller system, so you'll have to have a separate stroller that you transfer your baby out of the seat and then into the stroller and then back into the seat um, when you're ready to go home. And that means you'll have to have a convertible seat for every car the baby rides in. These convertible seats are very large. They're called convertible seats because they install rear facing when your child is an infant and then go forward facing when your child is a little bit older. So a little bit more in detail about each of these seats. So with an infant seat, the best place, the safest place for the infant is in the middle of the rear seat. This positions the infant seat away from all airbags and provides a buffer or cushion zone around the baby. Um, if you get a secondhand seat, someone gifts you a seat, um, it's a hand-me-down, you definitely want to check to make sure that the car seat is not expired. And yes, car seats actually do expire. After a while, especially in our California heat, pr plastic gets very brittle and um, car seats expire, so you have to check and make sure that there is an expiration date stamped on the car seat. If there's no expiration date, there is a manufacturer date stamped on the seat. And so car seats expire six years after the date of manufacture, so you definitely want to check that. Um, and you also want to make sure that obviously the car seat has not been involved in a, mo a moderate to a severe accident. When the seat is installed, you want to make sure that it's installed securely. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines for using the latch, which is the lower anchors and tether system, or there's ways that you can install the car seat. If you don't have a model car that has a latch system, you can use the lap belt to securely install the seat. And to make sure that it is properly installed, you want to check for the amount of movement in the seat. So you want to take both hands and shake that seat really, really well in all directions. And you should see no more than one inch of movement in either side to side or forward and back directions. Once you have that seat properly installed, you want to check the baby's fit inside the car seat. And so you want to make sure that the straps are at or below the level of the shoulders, wherever the, the harness is. 
and it should be tight enough that you can't pinch any slack in the straps. So one thing that I find is a lot of parents have the straps a little bit too loose. So when you pinch the strap, you shouldn't be able to pinch any of it. It should be really nice and tight. And then the chest clip is supposed to be at the level of the armpits. So to find that, what you wanna do is have your baby strapped in the car seat and then put both your fingers in each armpit of the baby and then adjust the clip so that it is level with your fingers. That's how you'll know that the clip is at the level of the armpits. And you wanna remove any bulky clothing before you strap the baby in. So any thicker sweaters, coats, you wanna remove that first, strap the baby in with the straps nice and tight, and then put bulky blankets and other things for warmth on top of that. And that's because anything that's bulky, like a blanket or a sweater, if it moves, all of a sudden the straps are too loose and that's not safe. And now convertible seats. You wanna keep these seats rear facing as long as possible. So these are um, large toddler seats and California state law is rear facing until two years of age. However, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that we keep rear kids rear facing until they basically max out the rear facing weight limit. We know that rear facing position is safest. So regardless of state law, whether you live in Nevada, or Arizona or California, it's best to keep your child rear-facing as long as you possibly can. And then the seat can be taken out, turned around, and reinstalled forward-facing. And once it's in the forward-facing position, the strap should be at or above the level of the shoulders, and it's ideal to keep your child in a five-point harness as long as possible. This helps to hold them securely in the seat. I find some of my older toddlers, they tend to fall asleep in the car, so in their a booster seat with just the car seat belt, they can kind of slump forward as they're falling asleep, so the five-point harness holds them in nice and securely. Um, sometimes it's advised that parents who may have a question about whether or not their car seat is installed safely can go to a police station or a um, fire department to make sure that the seat is properly installed. I would actually encourage parents to go to the Safe Kids Worldwide website they have a resource where you can um, plug in your zip code and they will direct you to actually a certified center. Some fire departments and police centers may not have the actual credentialing to ensure that your car seat is properly installed. Um, okay, so next is gonna be the question of bassinet and crib, or maybe both. Um, bassinets are wonderful because they're convenient for pulling right up against um, usually mom's side of the bed for frequent feedings throughout the night. They're pretty portable, so you can move them throughout the house, wherever you happen to be. Um, you can have the baby there napping. And um, I had a lot of questions about the new Snoo. This is the kind of luxury big ticket item, the um, crib that bassinet that kind of helps to soothe your baby. Um, I find that some babies do very well in a Snoo and some babies do not like the Snoo. So I think it really depends quite ultimately on the temperament of your baby. Um, but I've had a lot of parents try it out that fortunately you don't have to purchase the item, you can rent them now. Um, with cribs, you wanna be careful with secondhand cribs. Some of these are family heirlooms. So you wanna make sure that the slats of the crib meet current safety requirements and guidelines. Um, some of these older cribs have drop sides, which are also now um, not considered safe. But the biggest thing with cribs is absolutely no bumpers. I know they look very pretty. They often come with the whole crib set with the matching patterns. So take a nice picture of it in your nursery and then take the bumpers out because they are unfortunately a suffocation hazard as well as a strangulation hazard. So we don't recommend mesh bumpers at all. The only thing that should be in your child's crib is a fitted sheet and that is it. Um, and cribs are nice too because a lot of them, the manufacturers have them so that they can convert into a toddler bed so they can kind of grow with your child for a while. Um, a little word about sleep positioners, um, things like Docatot, um, boppy pillows and things like that. They're very popular as a way to have a baby nap kind of in a different position that they seem to be a little bit more comfortable in. Um, because in 1994, the American Academy of Pediatrics launched the Back to Sleep campaign, this was very successful in helping to reduce the risk of SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. Unfortunately, it led to an epidemic of flathead syndrome. So I've had parents ask me about 
well, my friend gave me this little pillow that's got a little cutout and it helps to prevent flatheads in my baby. And unfortunately, this is a suffocation hazard, so it's not recommended. Um, we also don't want to have anything positioning the baby, like a rolled blanket to prevent the baby from rolling over while they sleep. This is also, unfortunately, a suffocation hazard. Um, sometimes babies have some pretty significant reflux and we recommend that they're propped up slightly because it can help reduce their reflux symptoms. But you need to be careful that these wedges or inclines are no more than a 10 degree angle. Anything steeper is potentially a hazard. It should have a firm, smooth surface, not too soft. And um, some of them actually will have straps and harnesses, so you need to use those to prevent falling or rolling of the baby. Okay, a little word about clothing. Um, obviously, you're gonna need several changes of clothes for the baby, onesies, pants, sweaters, socks, mittens, booties, and hats. Um, one general rule of thumb about newborns is that they should be wearing one more layer of clothing than what you're comfortable wearing around the house. So if you're comfortable lounging around in your t-shirt and pants, then the baby should be wearing a onesie, pair of pants, and a sweater or a swaddle blanket. So one more layer. Indoors, if the house is comfortable, the baby does not need to wear a hat, but outdoors, definitely a hat is recommended. It helps to keep them warmer, and in the summer, a hat keeps them cooler, actually, and shades them. So that's an important um, piece to have when you leave the house. Um, mittens are sometimes popular for babies because of the concern about their nails and scratching their faces. Um, I find mittens don't generally stay on very well. Sometimes I think socks fit better over the hands than the mittens do, but that's something you guys can play around with. Um, diapers, so this is probably the most, you know, kind of most used in terms of um, caring for your baby. And I've had a lot of parents ask me about the difference between cloth and disposable diapers. I think a lot of people like the convenience of disposable, but also understand that wow, we go through a lot of diapers in a child's lifetime and they take absolutely forever to decompose. So a lot of people worry about the kind of environmental impact of disposable diapers and go with cloth. Um, cloth is definitely produces a lot of waste in terms of manufacturing process with the cotton versus paper pulp. But the problem is that there was actually a UK study that found that how parents care for the washing after a used cloth diaper can actually have a greater environmental impact. So um, that's something that you may want to consider as well. I've also had parents ask me about the incidence of diaper rash and irritation, cloth versus disposable, and I will say it's pretty even. It really depends on the use of diaper ointments and how frequently you're changing that diaper to prevent irritation. Okay, first aid kit. Probably the most essential things for a new baby is to have a bulb syringe or some sort of nasal aspirator. Babies are gonna constantly sneeze because they need to keep their nasal passages clear because babies are what we call obligate nose breathers. They really only know to breathe through their nose. So to help them out, you may need to have something to help suck out any boogies that might be cl clogging their nostrils. So it's helpful to have a bulb syringe, which you'll actually get when you're in the hospital. It's this blue rubber bulb-like device. And then another nasal aspirator device that's very popular right now is the nose Frida, which some parents think is kind of gross because you actually provide the suction, but it does have a filter and it works very effectively. It can help to have some nasal saline that helps to knock loose any dried boogies in your baby's nostrils and helps to um, make it easier to suck it out for the child. Um, thermometers are often very, very important piece of equipment. Um, there's lots of different choices out there on the market in terms of what kind of thermometer you want to buy. With newborns, because their ear canals are so teeny tiny, an ear thermometer isn't going to be the most effective thermometer. Usually we wait until babies are at least three months old before we would recommend something like that. Um, there's also thermometers that you can put under the arm. Um, temporal artery thermometers that kind of scan the forehead and take the temporal artery temperature. And then very popular lately are these infrared thermometers where you just point and shoot and you don't even have to touch the child. You can just get a thermometer reading that way. Um, the limitations of that is that you're really just taking the skin temperature. So just be aware that when you take the temperature, you're going to have to make some adjustments based on the way you've taken the temperature. For example, if you take the temperature under the armpit, you generally need to add one degree to get the true temperature. 
Um, Tylenol is always handy, and um, ibuprofen is popular to have in the house too, so that you don't have to run out in the middle of the night to go get it if you need it. But please keep in mind that ibuprofen is not appropriate for infants less than six months of age, and Tylenol and ibuprofen dosing is available on their respective manufacturers' websites, and that's a handy guide to have at home because you want to dose based on your child's weight and not their age. Okay, a little bit about skincare. So obviously shampoo, body cleanser, moisturizers. There's a lot of baby products out there. Um, a lot of them are organic and natural and things like that. Um, I've had some kids who had some pretty significant rashes from some of these products because they were natural plant extracts and they were unfortunately sensitive to those extracts. So you wanna be mindful that reactions can occur even with natural products. Uh, generally, I recommend going with things that are fragrance-free, chemical-free, even if it's not necessarily formulated for babies. They actually may be even better for your child's skin. Uh, something like Cetaphil Skin Cleanser is a fantastic choice for people with sensitive skin and for babies. Um, assortment of diaper ointments and creams are nice to have. There's sort of the zinc-based diaper ointments like Balmax or Desitin. Um, they're thick and white, very protective, drying, prevent yeast uh, diaper rashes. And then there's um, greasy ointments like Aquaphor, Vaseline, vitamin A and D ointment. They also work great, very good skin barriers and protect the skin from moisture. Um, in the beginning, you're gonna be kind of doing nail grooming very frequently. Babies have a very high metabolic rate and their nails grow like crazy. So you're gonna be trimming those nails sometimes two, even three times a week. Um, as newborns though, those nails are really, really paper thin and the skin tends to come right up under the nail. So I would actually recommend filing a baby's nails in the beginning. I know it's a lot more tedious, but it's definitely a lot more safe. Um, I, it's not unusual for me to get a phone call from a parent that accidentally nipped the skin on the tip of the finger. So nail file is definitely the way to go. Um, brush and comb for the baby's hair. Um, Oftentimes at around the um, three to four week mark, you can start to have things like a little bit of cradle cap up here on the baby's scalp, which is sort of a thick, kind of almost baby dandruffy, yellow scaly crustiness that can appear, and a brush or comb can be very helpful for kind of brushing and lifting that off. Um, towels and washcloths, lots of different options now for ba baby bathtubs. Some of them have, um, ones that you can just put in your kitchen sink or bathroom sink. Um, some bathtubs kind of grow with your child with a newborn hammock or insert to support a young baby. And then once they achieve really good head and neck control, then they can sit properly in a tub, um, Q-tips and cotton balls and things like that. Um, I'm frequently asked also how often I should be bathing my baby. Um, there was actually a very interesting study last year out of Britain that found that n bathing babies more frequently than once a week can actually cause more skin dryness, kind of disrupt the skin barrier and predispose them to conditions like eczema. So until they're rolling around in the dirt in the playground, you don't have to bathe them that often. Once a week should be fine. It's also a good idea to bathe your baby separately from shampooing the hair. So I generally recommend bathe the body, get them nice and dry, dress them, wrap them in a blanket, and then shampoo the hair so they don't get too chilled. Okay, feeding. So, nursing pillows are wonderful for moms who are choosing to breastfeed. Um, even an eight pound baby can get very heavy after a while. So nursing pillows offer a little bit more support for a mom and enables moms to keep their back nice and straight so you don't injure your back um, hunching over your baby. Um, there is an incredibly dizzying array of different bottles out there. Um, lots of different choices with different nipple sizes, flow rates, shapes, some that you know purport to minimize swallowed air and gas. I find that in real life, it's really hard to know what your baby's gonna like. So sometimes it's helpful to have a variety of different styles of bottles so that you can try them out and see which one your baby works best with. Um, moms frequently like having a breast pump so that they can um, pump some breast milk. Um, especially if they're planning on going back to work. I've had a lot of moms who started to build up a little cash um, for when they go back to work and then milk storage bags for um, storing that pumped breast milk either in the fridge or the freezer. Um, pacifier, 
This is where there's a little bit of controversy about when do we actually introduce a pacifier. Um, some of the uh, lactation consultants will recommend that we wait until at least about two to four weeks of age, make sure that breastfeeding is firmly established before we introduce that pacifier. Um, I find that pacifiers are a great way to sue the fussy baby. Um, in general, I find most babies tend to latch pretty well no matter what they do. And as pediatricians, we love pacifiers because it helps babies to soothe. And when babies fall asleep with a pacifier, we have several studies that find that it actually reduces your risk of SIDS. So as, pa as pediatricians, we love pacifiers. Um, and then, of course, for moms who are nursing, nipple cream, ointment, nipple shields, nursing pads, nursing covers, those are all things that you may want to also have ready to go when your baby comes home. Okay, now some of the extras, which aren't absolutely essentials, but also very important pieces of baby gear, like blankets and swaddlers, um, the way to transport your baby around town, so strollers versus carriers, um, baby monitor, um, high chair swings, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the diaper bag. So blankets and swaddlers. So we know that swaddling newborns can help with calming and with sleeping. This is a centuries old practice that we have continued because we know it works. It mimics the close, cozy environs of the womb and helps babies to calm down. But we want to wean them from swaddling after two months of age. You wanna be very cautious about swaddling too tightly. Um, swaddling is really intended to keep the arms still so that the baby doesn't just kind of jerk and startle themselves awake. But doing the swaddle too tightly around the hips can actually interfere with their hip development. So we want any swaddle to have lots of room for the babies to kick and move their legs, but give them a big hug around their arms and shoulders. Um, I'm seeing some of these muslin blankets are very popular because they can be used as a swaddle blanket. They're very generously sized. They're quite breathable. So they're a great option for the summer. Um, but they, I've seen them being used as burp cloths, nursing cover, car seat cover, stroller cover. So those are really popular. And, and over the years, I'm seeing a lot of companies making them in really nice cotton, even bamboo fabrics with super cute prints on them. Um, there's also lots of um, other products that have the Velcro straps that help with people who are having a little trouble with swaddling. Those are a great option as well. Okay, strollers versus carriers, or maybe even both. So a lot of strollers are um, work designed to work with many different companies' car seats, which is a great convenient system for a lot of parents. They have the advantage of having extra room to carry all sorts of gear, um, and you're not the pack mule, so it's a much more comfortable way to carry all the things that you need with your baby. Um, unfortunately, you, that means you're limited to smooth sidewalks, elevators, can't take an escalator with a stroller. And one thing that um, I would stress is that these really should not be used beyond age three. Um, by three years of age, children really can walk well, and um, the American Academy of Pediatrics really recommends that those children should be walking. Um, kids who are in strollers pretty consistently beyond that, we worry about them kind of getting more comfortable with a more sedentary lifestyle. So we want them to be walking when they're a little older. And then with strollers, there's all different types of strollers, walking, umbrella, portable, packable, jogging strollers. Um, and then with parents that are looking at different stroller options, I would really recommend looking at one that can configure in many directions. We know that babies are talked to more by their parents if you're holding your baby, and then kind of second most when they're in the stroller facing you. But once they're in that stroller facing away from you, it's kind of hard to talk to them. So we really want more that parental interaction which is why a lot of people like going with baby carriers. They're hands-free, but they also carry that baby snugly right against you. So it really, the thought is that it promotes greater bonding with your child. Unfortunately, that means you don't get to carry as many gear things with you, but it does give you greater mobility. So hiking, walks on the beaches, things like that. Um, also busy, crowded urban cities. I had a mom who had a business trip in New York City and I told her, ditch the stroller you're gonna to want to carry her, and she said that was the best piece of advice ever because it helped her to navigate subways really well and she didn't have a bulky stroller on busy, crowded city streets. 
Um, but the one thing about carriers is that there is the potential for injury. I've unfortunately had a lot of babies who were in the carrier, and because you really can't see that sidewalk very well, I've had um, caregivers trip and fall, and unfortunately the baby sustain some head injury. So you really need to be very mindful of your surroundings when you're using a baby carrier and you have your baby in that. Okay, baby monitors. Um, so probably the very most popular are the video monitors. They're wonderful because with our technology now, they have really nice screens. Some of them even have night vision. You can even see your baby sleeping at nighttime with a perfectly clear image. Um, audio monitors are kind of nice as a backup option or at like a you know grandparent's house or when you're traveling. Um, but a lot of them also offer two-way communication. I've also had a lot of questions about some of these movement monitors or breathing monitors. Um, the outlet comes to mind as a popular one that I get asked about frequently. But I want to remind people that these are not medical devices. They're not FDA approved and there's no evidence that they protect against SIDS. And I find that they're a great way to give yourself a heart attack in the middle of the night because they often go off with false alarms. So I don't really see them as being very useful. Um, high chair. So this is something that you're going to be using starting at about six months of age because this is when we start solid foods for the first time. And when you're looking for a high chair, you want to make sure that it's something easy to clean because more nooks and crannies means more food stuck in all those places. Um, it should be pretty durable, um, should last at least a couple of years, and stable. Um, some friends of mine had a very nice, fancy, kind of modern, beautiful wooden high chair. And unfortunately, when their child got older, they were able to put their feet up against the dining room table, kick, and tip themselves over. So that's one thing you really want to watch out for. Um, double check safety features like harnesses and straps. Some high chairs have wheels that you can kind of conveniently use to move around the kitchen or the, the table. You want to make sure those wheels um, lock. Some have fancy like uh, upholstery, seat height adjustments, um, detachable trays. Um, there's also a popular option that's just the seat that clips directly to the table. For some families, that's a really great option, particularly if you don't have a whole lot of space in your, um, in your home. Okay, swings, bouncy chairs, loungers. So these are fantastic because it can be hard to just carry your baby around all the time and they can be a great place for your baby to kind of calm down and you don't have to hold them all the time. So you wanna make sure that these are placed on a flat, low, stable surface. You don't want them tipping or falling. You don't want them on a table. They don't want them falling off a height like that. And for young babies, you want to use them in the most reclined position because they don't have the head and neck strength just yet, so you want them in the most reclined position as possible. But the most important thing is to always follow your manufacturer's guidelines using the straps and harnesses in these devices and always, always supervise your baby. Unfortunately, a lot of babies are injured or die in these kinds of devices because they're not intended for sleeping. And a, a lot of babies, once they're calm, they just end up falling asleep. And so parents are like, oh my God, the baby's finally calm, so I'm not gonna touch them. But this is actually the time that you should transfer them into a safe sleep environment. Um, unfortunately, many children die in these devices um, because they're not really designed for safe sleeping. Um, there have been many products over the years that have been recalled because of this, so it is something to kind of keep in mind that they can be a hazard if you're not supervising and they fall asleep in them. And then probably it's kind of the most fun thing is the diaper bag. So they come in lots of different styles, backpack, messenger style. Um, but this is probably going to be the most utilitarian piece of equipment you have. It, you want it to have at least um, the ability to hold five diapers or a cal quick calculation is one to two diapers for every hour that you're going to be outside your home. Um, obviously wipes, uh, diaper cream, ointment, um, a disposal bag for the d diaper if you're not immediately next to a trash can. Um, a wet bag is really handy to keep separate any soiled clothing, to keep it separate from all the other clean stuff in your diaper bag. Um, it's always nice to have an extra change of clothes for babies because you never know when there's gonna be 
what I like to refer to as the punami or poop accident. And also, it's nice to have a change of clothing for you because you may get spit up on, peed on, pooped on, so it's nice to have an extra t-shirt for yourself. Um, portable changing pad, hand sanitizer, and um, assorted feeding supplies. And then I didn't include a lot of the other extras like phone charger and things like that because I feel like this is probably the most essential stuff, but a lot of diaper bags have all sorts of extra pockets and such for like, you know, insulated bags and things like that. So that's kind of more personal preference and style. And then I'm gonna stop here to answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay, so question I have is how do you avoid um, a baby getting a flat head, which is actually a really, really good question because we know that back to sleep is the safest sleep position. So one thing that I recommend is make sure that you alternate which way your baby's head is positioned when they're sleeping. So one nap, you wanna have them turn this way, the next nap this way, and try to alternate that. Otherwise, there's really not much else you can do. The other thing is the more you kind of carry your baby around, it helps promote bonding, and also that's less time on the back of their head, so that's another um, reason why carriers are very popular for parents. Um, the Dakotot doesn't necessarily cause it. Um, I know that's a really popular device, but it's not designed for sleep. It's really designed as a place to put dock your tot so you can watch them for a little bit. But I know a lot of parents use that in the parent's bed for sleep, and that is not a safe sleep environment, so I do not recommend that. Okay, so how would a baby get hurt in a swing if asleep and there's no suffocation hazard? So one way that this happens is when they fall asleep like this, and depending upon the age of the baby, even though there's nothing else in the, ba in the swing with the baby, they can roll their head like this and pinch off their airway. And that's um, one way that babies can um, unfortunately um, suffocate in, in, a, in a swing. The other way is if their whole torso kind of comes over. And so that can happen sometimes too because some of these swings, the harness is just over the hips and not really over the shoulders. But even if it's over the shoulders, there's nothing really supporting a baby's head. So it's really these younger infants that haven't quite achieved head control yet where their head can fall forward and that is the concern. Okay, so it looks like we're not getting any more questions. So I'd really thank you guys for joining us tonight for this talk and um, hope you guys have a great evening. Thank you.